Good afternoon and welcome everybody um, to the first collaboration between Studio X Johannesburg, uh, AIDS Gallery, Sidewalk Productions, uh, and the Witt City Institute. My name is Mpoma Madzipa and I am the curator of Studio X. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm um, Kodisha Samshana. I'm the curator and co-founder of Play Together. So we'd like to welcome you. Uh, seeing quite a number of new faces, so uh, we're, we're looking forward to a continued collaboration with Studio X. And we'd like to welcome uh, Professor Lewis Gordon. And uh, hey, a round of applause to him. That was a good yeah, okay. just hand over to you. <laughs> Thanks, Lori. I'm not going to bore you with too much ceremony. I just um, um, want, to, want to thank and welcome uh, Lewis Gordon for um, making it out to Soweto to be with us this afternoon. Today's um, session is actually a bit of an experiment. So first of all, thank you for your patience. Um, we all know that we work on CPT, so you're doing, we're all doing really, really well for a Saturday afternoon. Um, but today's session is actually an experiment. Um, when I first spoke to Lewis about um, giving a talk, um, one of the things that we discussed, which is something that is very central to his own practice, is actually doing a lot of work outside of the university. And um, when I explained to him that I'd also um, done quite a bit of work with artists in different parts of the city, his suggestion was to have a jam session. And um, thankfully, Sidewalk Productions, particularly Tabo, um, uh, came to the fore in terms of really opening up the space and inviting a family of soldiers to participate in this jam session. Um, so I'm not going to speak much further other than to introduce the hostess with the mostess, Marcel Lo, who will be um, managing the jam session. But before we get to the jam session, I'm going to ask um, Lewis Gordon to say a few words. Um, he's told me repeatedly that he's been to Soweto many times, so I think he's actually a man who needs very little introduction, other than to say that he's a philosopher, um, an Afro-Jewish philosopher who teaches at the University of Connecticut at Storrs and is an Nelson Mandela Scholar at the university currently known as Rhodes. Please um, give a warm welcome to Lewis Gordon. Oh. So good afternoon, welcome. Great to see you all. So you, as you all can see, I don't only uh, talk. <laughs> and there are a lot of other things I do, but we don't need to get to that. I'm going to make a few words that could connect to some of the things that Empo and I talked about. And some of the things, I'm just going to talk about two things. The first thing I'm going to talk about, since this weekend is Fanon-Omania, there's just Fanon, Fanon, Fanon. Fanon is being spoken around, vids here, everywhere. And as you know, as we know, Fanon is not only talking about in South Africa. Fanon is talked about across the continent, across South America, across Central America, North America, Europe, Asia, everywhere. And all these people said, you know, who wants to hear what this young black individual who died at the age of 36 had to say? And the answer is a whole lot of people. Now, so I'm going to talk a little about that, and then I'm going to talk about the question of what we get at decolonizing the city. And they both connect to Fanon because, as Empo and others were surprised to find out, Fanon actually talked a lot about architecture. He talked about cities and he talked about space. For instance, some of you may not, there's some things that some of you may not know. When he, was, when he wrote his dissertation, that enabled him to be a medical doctor. Fanon had written it on Friedrich's disease, and that's a spinal condition that renders the patient completely dependent on the care of another. And one of the things Fanon immediately noticed is that the very structure of a hospital room was designed to make that person in a period of physical de de deterioration suffer a kind of mental deterioration from a loss of dignity. So Fanon wrote in his dissertation about how to rethink what the patient-physician relationship was. And that part of healing is also knowing that you don't only heal a physical body. And this is a crucial thing to think about. And Paul and I were talking about healing this morning, and she said, man, I keep meeting a lot of healers. But you know, healers in the world also emerge because in healing others, you learn how to heal yourself. 
And we tend to separate these things. In fact, we do a lot of separation. And this has been a problem that's become a chronic disease. Because there are, what, there are ways in which people think you should compartmentalize everything. Put it here, put it there. Somehow, for instance, the university is there, it functions one way. If this is a room, originally because it was supposed to be a lecture, it was set up in the standard lecture format. And we said, why? And one of the things we have to learn is that you don't have to do things the way they have been done. And perhaps changing things around could create a different space. In fact, a more human space. And Fanon did that a lot in his life. He was, a, he was not only a forensic psychiatrist, but he was also a clinical psychiatrist. And here's something some of you may not know. When he went to Algeria and he looked at the way the hospitals were set up, when he looked at the way the, the, way the asylum was set up, Fanon's criticism was that it wasn't set up actually for one to become healthy, but the very structure of the buildings and the place were designed to produce mental illness. And then he began to think through when he was fighting in the Algerian war, when he was in Tunisia, Fanon made the same point about how buildings and structures and cities are set up. And it was he, in fact, who founded the first daycare facility, I'm sorry, day health care, outpatient care facility on this continent. And these things were connected to a lot of issues that some of you may not have thought about. For instance, in South Africa right now, there's been such an assault on the ability to think politically that many people walk around talking about politics and they don't realize they're not talking about politics at all. They're talking about morals. They're talking about who is pure, who is more clean and correct than the others. And the problem when you take that mentality is you're so busy trying to fix people that you don't fix the social conditions that are screwing over people. So you can have a whole lot of people who are correct and nice and spiritually together, you could say you like them, while they live in a completely messed up world. Fanon was more interested in fixing that world. And so one of the things he noticed was that some of his patients were there because of the political conditions. It wasn't something wrong with their brain, their heart, their lungs. It wasn't because of some, for instance, some condition of their cerebral cortex. They were there because they lived in a world in which the, that world, in order for them to be happy, and a lot of mental health care is about making you happy, the problem is if you're going to be happy in the sense of completely adjusted to a really messed up world, then you would in effect be the happy slave. So Fanon actually said the real issue is to be angry, but to have the right kind of anger. And what is the right kind of anger? is to understand that there's a problem with a system instead of dealing with authenticity and moralizing self-righteous stuff. So for part of Fanon's practice, his medical practice, is for people to see more clearly what those conditions are. So he started this first outpatient care facility because there's a difference between people who need brain surgery and people who are dealing with being dehumanized each day. And he set it up because he said, how are you going to take people who are being degraded and dehumanized and take them away from the institutions like their family, their friends, their lovers, their, 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 their music, their institutions, the things that remind them that they're valuable as human beings. So for Fanon, you should immerse them in that and he as the therapist should find a way to relate to that. In other words, the issue isn't that there's a world trying to screw you over. The issue is whether you're developing the right relationships to strengthen you to change that world. And that's what we lose sight of with that mentality. Because you see, we fail to build the conditions for our freedom because we're too busy locked in actually a form of masochistic self-pity for our suffering. Now within that framework, Fanon, interestingly enough, and as we were talking earlier, some things people miss because people said, oh, you mean he's like Foucault? Now here's the part that's ridiculous. People talk about Foucault with the, you know, ending asylums, the birth of the clinic, but what they don't know about Foucault is that Foucault started that research in Tunisia when he went there in 66 to be with his lover. And really think about this. There's no way you could be in Tunisia where one of the greatest revolutionaries of the 20th century, not just in politics, but in psychiatry, who created the outpatient care clinic, who argued you needed to get rid of asylums, there's no way 
that that charismatic individuals in this place of revolutionaries could have made this mark and Foucault landed there and not heard of Frantz Fanon. Not only that, when he was when landed there, Foucault was seeing the fruits of what Fanon did. And Foucault, using those ideas, go to France and write as if madness was just some preoccupation with a group of French people and English people and write about panopticity and Bentham and all of this stuff when these were ideas drawn from people on this continent. So already if you think about what I just said, it should tell you something important in your struggles, which is a very simple and banal but important message. Know your history. Because if you don't know that history, you think ideas can only come from Europe. When in fact, some of those ideas, the creative ones, the ones in which you're building liberatory and revolutionary thought, came from here. But you see, part of the process of colonizing your mind is to give you collective amnesia. Part of that process is to make you believe you cannot be what Fanon called actional. Because you see, when there are things that need to be done, what that inculcates into you is this. You know, we ought to have a bridge. You know, we, we ought to have, this book ought to be written. You know, we ought to have a certain struggle waged. You notice people are always telling you what you have to do if late in South Africa is always looking for somebody else to do it. People like Fanon, people like Mangani, I was talking to him this morning about this. People like Anna Julia Cooper, people like Amata Aidu. We can go, keep going on the list. There's a long list of people who said, if they see something ought to be done, you know what they do? They go and do it. They don't ask if they will succeed, if they will fail. They simply go and do it. Even if they only get that far, that's one distance less someone else has to go. And that's what we forget about struggle. We keep thinking that if we step out there, we must be on the other side of the mountain before we take the first step. When in fact, you can't get there unless you take the steps, build the foundations. And one of the things that Fanon believed in, and you all may not know this, is he believed one of his projects when he died was he was trying to build a United States of Africa. Now, what in the world would be a United States of Africa? It means you have to rethink Africa. Because you see, you'd have to imagine an Africa where you don't have to use visas and borders and stuff to go from one place to another. It means you'd have to imagine an Africa in order to be connected that way. You have an infrastructure of asphalt that connects from Cape Town all the way through to not only Algiers and Tunis and those cities, to Egypt, all the way through Accra and those, but it's also more than that. Because this is a big continent. And what Fanon understood is that if you have a big continent that's full of all kinds of things, from lithium to platinum to copper to oil, all kinds of fruits and vegetables, even plants that could be used for pharmaceuticals that a lot of people don't even know about, then you know what a continent that size, called the United States of Africa, could build? An internal economy. You know, I went to Brazil several times. It was one time, but when I first went to Brazil, something struck me. The, I spent a month in Brazil, and in, in a month in Brazil, when I went to Brazil for the first time, which was in 2006, I only came across three products at that time that were built in the United States or China. And those products were McDonald's, Coca-Cola, and the more complex thing was, um, oh, it has many names, Exxon in the States, but I forgot, Esso. But I didn't even come across a lot of made in China products. And you know why? Brasilia, Brazil is so large that it was able to build on its resources an economy in which even the televisions, the phones, all of that were built in Brazil. Even get this, the startup engine for the computer. That's why when all those viruses hit Microsoft or even Apple, they never hit a Brazilian computer because it had a different startup engine. You see what I'm getting at? Now, there are people invested in you in this continent not having those things. 
Sure as hell, if it had those things, it would have a different relation to dictating the prices of its products. It would be different in how it dictates many other things. And so what Fanon began to say is be creative. Don't think you have to do things the way they've been done. And among those, he began to talk about the city. For instance, he noticed that every time an African country declares its independence, what does it do? It creates a capital city that's a duplication of a European city. And in having that capital city as a center, duplicates European forms of governing. And then within that, it creates a deep, deep, a deep appreciation of the value of rural peoples, of people who are not locked into a particular conception of economies that are like the European working class. And it starts a process in its very architecture of telling you, the everyday people of this continent, that you don't matter. See, it's not just about someone insulting you and speaking to you in a certain way. From the very structures you walk in, it's telling you that you can only exist if you walk in them a certain way. And so it means you have to be creative when you talk about decolonization, not just about writing theories about whether you're dealing with a, a form of shift up esteem. It's not simply about talking about how you talk about essence and how you're going to talk about how you do a decolonial practice. It means you have to talk about it in terms of the imagination of how even to set the conditions of how you talk about things. And this was why Fanon was radical and a revolutionary. And if you're going to be a mimic, then you're implicitly saying that your colonization was right. But if you're really going to say your colonization was wrong, it means you have to build an alternative. You could criticize colonialism all you want, and Fanon was very good at criticizing it. But it doesn't mean anything if you don't build an alternative. So architecture is a very important metaphor for this. But when he went to that, Fanon said something very interesting. When he was talking about intellectuals, he talked about artists. You notice today something has happened. There's been a colonization of intellectuals because we forget that artists are intellectuals. Today, when we talk about intellectuals, we often are talking about academics. Now, here's the problem. You see, if you knock intellectuals outside of the public sphere, the alternative spheres, and put them only on the campus, then the only way those intellectuals are able to articulate their position is if they have what's called a job, an academic job. And this is what the neoconservatives or the neoliberals understood. If they're so wedded to getting these jobs so bad, how much are they going to give up to keep it? It's amazing, isn't it? Fanon wrote, uh, riffing on Brico, he wrote what he wanted, what he liked. Because it's weird to think that Fanon could be threatened with not getting tenure. It's weird to think that Fanon is going to be threatened with being fired. Because you know what he would say if you say, well, we'll fire you if you say that. He'll like, well, merde. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, that's French for you. We already know. <laughs> well, some of you don't. If you don't know, it's shit. <laughs> he'll, he'll say, Go ahead. And this is the crucial point. You see, if you colonize through the market, the academy, then you colonize the, 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 the knowledge it produces. And one of the things Fanon said when he looked at artists, he said he noticed something. When independence comes, the politicians ask which set of European or North American powers they're going to imitate. So it becomes, are you going to be like England, France, or the United States, or Canada? But when artists get together, it's rather very interesting. Because even the initial in moment of imitation, artists often try to get a version of their art that speaks to the way things are done here. The fact of the matter is that although there was, again, pre-colonial artistic expression, it's not that artists stopped producing art when colonization occurred. But when independence comes, the artists now begin to produce art in a way that creates, for instance, South African art. Or, if you want to say, a Zanian art. When we came together, no musician here, no artist here, had an advanced knowledge. Some didn't even know I played drums, right? 
You saw me sit down, you saw us play, and you heard music. Now, if I sat down there to say it's all about me, I would have not been paying attention to my fellow musicians. And if I didn't pay attention to them, it would sound horrible. And here's the crucial part. Although we are musicians, did you notice when the other musician was playing, the other musicians went behind to try to make that musician play better. Now really think about it. There are people who try to convince you that human nature, whenever you hear human nature, be very careful. That means you're going to hear a lot of manure. They want you to think that human nature is one against all. That we have to, I have to sit there avariciously, selfishly, to find out who plays better than whom. Who do, you see what I'm getting at? But, if, but we weren't thinking about who plays better than whom. We were thinking about the music. You can't play music if you're busy with your ego. To play music, you have to let back your ego and let the music come out. What if the issue in South Africa, in Brazil, in India, in Kenya, all over the world, what if the issue was to let go of our egos and let the society groove? We use these narrow models of justice and law and corrections, and they have their place, but we human beings need more than that. And if we enable there to be a society that can express itself in a way that brings out the strength in each other, it can groove precisely because what we were looking for is not to compete with each other, but to bring out each other's excellence. Everyone in this room has something she or he is excellent at, and a society that blocks that is an oppressive society. But a society that learns to play together in the metaphor that these artists today play is a society I can guarantee you that would be a better one. Thank you. Louis um, thank you very much. Um, I think you've given everybody some food for thought. And the musicians, I think, will find an interesting way to speak back to that. My name is Marcelo Mutana, by the way. I'm going to be hosting this journey that we're going to take to try and reimagine and refunction how we see our societies and how we see this particular city of Johannesburg, considering uh, how it was formed, its origins, and where it's going. And we find ourselves going back and forth, you know. It's a, it's a hustling city. But we are not sure where the waves of change are coming from because the system hasn't changed. So there's no gold, there's just quadrisment of gold. like. <laughs> So we're going to build up our gem nicely. We're going to start with a, the master himself. I can only get away with saying that. Yeah. I'm not going to say it the whole night. I'm just going to say it twice with the master. So Luis is going to start us off, and then we're going to build it up slowly. And uh, I, I, once it's built up, I, I would like to offer something called a blues for Fanon. And then the journey will continue. So the other performers, Nkela Nizo Shalalagu, Frank Droleska, Imaizi, Saddam Daftis. My name is Lewis Gordon. I was born in Jamaica. I grew up in the United States. And I teach at the University of Connecticut at stores in philosophy, African diasporic studies, Jewish studies, Asian studies. And I'm also the European Union Chair in Philosophy at Toulouse in France. And for two years, I've been the Mandela Professor in Politics and International Studies at the university currently known as Rhodes. I also teach philosophy and government in Jamaica, and I do a variety of other things. And as you see, I'm also a musician. I come to South Africa to be a participant in a shared project. Not just South Africa, I go across the world. I travel in so many places that people, everybody in the world seems to think I'm partly local. What's the point of doing these things if you're not doing what you're committed to? But people always say they're committed to this and that, but then they go and they go back into their very narrow, 
you know, sequestered existence. The fact of the matter is, having any talent, any ability is an obligation. Every rapper, everybody in the audience who came out, why did they come? They came not only to listen and to hear, but in a way to contribute, because collectively we created something that is not only imaginative, but an understanding that we are the only ones, all of us today, on whom the future rests. It's important for me to give my best to value being valued by you. Because you, as a valuable subject, have something to offer that we can share in building excellence. The musicians created excellent music because we valued and we had faith in each other's ability to contribute, and we wanted each other to do our best. Studio X Johannesburg and I'm also a researcher with the Witt City Institute. I like to think of myself as a connector and so uh, what I do a lot of is to try and curate collaborations between people who I think are doing really cool things in the city. When I was introduced to Lewis Gordon and we discussed um, the possibility of him giving a talk through Studio X, it quickly evolved into a discussion about a collaboration between himself and creative people in the city. Um, one of the things that I'm really passionate about is developing a new vocabulary for talking about the present. I think that the apartheid language of separation and segregation is exhausted and I think that artists have an important role to play in reimagining the city and also bringing a new vocabulary into being. So the ways in which uh, visual artists, musicians, philosophers think about the present, the black condition, uh, the state of cities, different ways of conceptualizing, talking about, reimagining um, a way out of neoliberalism is one of the fundamental things that drives a lot of the collaborations that I, that I try and support. Even though I'm trained as an architect, I spend a lot of time um, listening to artists, looking at artists' work. So I've worked with jazz musicians, photographers, filmmakers, um, and right now it's a philosopher. And luckily for us, Lewis Gordon is also a musician, and he's the one who actually initiated a conversation about jamming um, with people who do 
hip hop and jazz. I think it's important to talk about the contribution of sidewalk productions and a family of soldiers. Um, when you're in the academy, it's very easy to, to lose sight of how many people outside of the academy are doing incredible work. And I think I'm deeply grateful to Tabor for introducing me to a family of soldiers and also just to um, encouraging me to engage much more creatively with Soweto. What you see is what you get, and that is my conception. The situation left me scarred amongst the evolution. My peers lost to friend amongst this generation. No direction, no shit, we live between commotion. Obama left in a car, I need the appellation. Riding in someone else's car seems to be the fashion. Why bother buying mine? Where's the education? Dropping out of school seems to be the best option. Miss education, lack of self-appreciation. I was born and raised to be the one with no position. In this world, I'm just seen as just a damn illusion. Stupid girls like me are seen as respiration. Human beings not worth the appreciation of a male species to show us the affection. We seek a vision to find some sort of destination. Yes. I am Esoeto Eetu Salador. Um, and yeah, I'm out here to have fun with some friends. Today, for the very first time in my 26 years of being on this earth, I came to an event in South Africa where not a single person had a weave on their head. That is incredible. I really wish I could grab each and every person and their personality and their style and take them everywhere to just to showcase what, what beauty we, we have as black people, as black women, without trying to incorporate a lot of like Eurocentrism. Decolonizing Joburg for me would be the city, would be for everybody, black people mostly, to embrace who they are and be happy with it and be able to showcase it to the world so they can see what being an African really is. My name is Kunsa Samsara. I'm the curator and co-founder of A2 Gallery. We want to use music to really communicate politics. In terms of intellect, I mean, we established the first universities in the world, you know. We brought civilization to the world, you know. And it's just that we need to be able to uh, sort of embrace that, you know, and, and rediscover that and make events like this more meaningful in the sense that we are able to have and spark conversations and dialogues that revolve around the idea of the African Renaissance and yeah, and, and, and try and move together as, as, as practitioners in the industry, you know. Spinara, para para, 
Sakamabande, Sana Uchela, Cesar Kuno Sumshawan Tara, Tela Rufa, Matule Kitima, Trevi, Utopo, Tapalala. They sleep in graves of memorable oppression, those who die to secure our limited liberty. Give freely your voice to watch the first soil of a renewed Africa. Give free your tears to the chorus of a people begging for food on the chorus of the world. Give freely and remember that they pave the way. They are what remains when politics and exploitation no longer sway the affairs of the day. Uh, my name is Ephraim Lefe. I'm a resident around here. Since from 1955, you are not born yet yet. I'm happy what's happening here. Youth, youth are gaining something out of this. You are building the nation, people. You are building the nation. The nation is getting up out of what you are doing here. I like to have a 100% praise to you. Decolonization. It's like a rebuilding your country. You are building people. You are building these youngsters to get on a track. Get out of the street, because many of them, they are on the street. Get up, wake up, build South Africa. We used to have Mrs. Black South Africa, Mrs. White South Africa. We had Mrs. Black South Africa here. We used to have beauty queens marching here in age, not in Sentin, here. Some say it's 20 years. Why? Why? No, we are doing something. We cannot say uh, people on the parliament must do everything for us. We must do it ourselves. It's what we are doing, decolonization. I'm happy. People, we are here. Let's build a country. This is a good, it's a, it's a good initiative. Um, if it can actually occur on a monthly basis, or perhaps maybe on a, on a second week, week basis, that would be a good thing, actually. Decolonizing the city, um, for me, it would mean, you know, breaking barriers, doing things differently, in a sense, not conforming. We didn't even know which artists would show up. We, some said they would come, but others showed up. And you notice when I was asked to give a beat, and we started playing. When we performed, each of us tried to do what we could to make each person who was now focused on do her or his best performance. And what if instead of music, you also say a better political society, a better conception of the city. If we bring the creative excellence so everybody could contribute, then perhaps we could have something that we can offer to other generations that they could build on. And the idea is not going to be perfect, it's going to be celebrated and start for something else to come.